is Off Script with Trish Glose, intimate interviews and conversations with interesting people. And in front of my mic today is Dr. Robin Miller. I'm glad I'm considered an interesting person. Right? You're that category of interesting, of interesting people. Interesting to me, at least. Um, so you are a local doctor here. Yes. An internist, yes. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but what? explain what that is, an internist. An internist is an adult doctor, so I see adults. I don't a, see children. A grown-up doctor. Yeah, it's sort of a general doctor for adults. People, you have to put on your, your big girl panties to come see you. You do. Okay. Although <laughs> I, I, I generally don't do it, but I will see teenagers. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so I always like to start off with, where are you from? Originally? I'm Originally. From Chicago. Okay. So how long did you live in Chicago? I lived in Chicago till I went to college. Okay. So what, I was 18. What college? University of Michigan. Okay. So tell me a little bit about growing up in Chicago. What was that like? And give me, a, if you if you dare, give me a time frame. Uh, I was born in 1953. Okay. And I graduated high school in 1971. Okay. So that well, tells you how old I am now. <laughs> um, growing up in Chicago for me was wonderful. We lived in Wilmette, which is a suburb of Chicago. And we lived on a block called Lincoln Lane. Nice. Lincoln Lane was amazing. What everyone, made it amazing? Everyone knew each other. Everyone take, took care of each other. Um, all the kids would go out to play every night. There was no internet. There were no cell phones. And all we did was play till it got dark, and our moms called us in. And all the moms watched out for each other. That is amazing. Yes. Yeah, so every year we'd do this Lincoln Lane Fair. My neighbor, Candy, would do it with me. And we made money for UNICEF. Oh, really? It was so cool. It was like the coolest thing. How old were you then? Oh, I was young. Candy was a year older than me. So we were like, started when I was about 10. And you're raising money for UNICEF? Yes, we raised some money for UNICEF. Okay, how did that even start? Well, at that time, that was a big deal. Okay. Uh, uh, Halloween, that's what you did. Oh, okay. Um, and then can it was Candy's idea. Nice. So she was my next door neighbor. And that's what we did. It was We're like the coolest. I mean, when I think about how we grew up, I, I'm just in awe. Really? I'm sorry my children didn't have that. Mm. Where's Candy now? Do you know? Candy is in Napa Valley. She's retired. She's amazing. She um, worked for KPTV. No, no. What's the one in San Francisco? Uh, oh, you're testing my skills now. She's a, she was a big producer there. Oh, okay. So news, TV news producer. Did news, and then she went to CNET. She's just one of these visionaries. Wow. And she's now the she's... one that told me all about the internet. I didn't know what the heck she was talking about. <laughs> and she said, you'll be able to see traffic before you go into traffic. I'm like, how could you do that? Yeah. I, I still couldn't wrap my mind around it, but she saw it way ahead of time. That's crazy. I'll move this a little closer. Um, and she's now in Napa? Yeah, she's in Napa, retired, and having a great time. Candy sounds amazing. She's amazing. Does she? Ever, do you guys ever see each other? Yeah, she's going to be visiting this summer. Maybe you want her on your show. She's pretty Maybe so. All right, Candy, I'd love to have you on. Um, and she, you guys were friends for uh, until you moved away. I mean, obviously We've you're still friends. We've always been friends. But yeah, like she's next like another neighbors. sister. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Okay, so also with childhood, what was family life like? Did you have siblings? Did you grow up with yes, siblings? Yes, I have a brother and a sister. Okay. What are were I'm you? The in oldest. The, oh, I should have known. <laughs> should have known. It was fun. I mean, obviously we had squabbles, but yeah, my parents were pretty amazing. My dad was unbelievable. Like, he always knew when history was going to happen. Really? Oh, yeah. So I remember in uh, the 68 Democratic Convention in mm -hmm. Chicago, mm -hmm. we're sitting in Old Town, which is in a certain part of Chicago, eating dinner, and this brick comes through the window onto the table, wow. and he goes, oh my gosh. And my mom goes, we're going home, right? He goes, no. You need to see what a riot's all about. <gasps> you need to be part of history. Wow. So he took us down there, and then eventually the police came and said, excuse me, sir, you need to go back to the suburbs. Oh, that's so <laughs> but, funny. I mean, who yeah. does that? No. Yeah, no one. Most parents no would be one. like, let's go. No. We have to point out we are not alone in the, in the podcast room. This is Vegas. Yes. What kind of dog is Vegas? He's mostly a German Shepherd. He's, okay. a, he's a rescue. He's gorgeous. He's amazing. You got him two years ago? Yes, two years ago. Isn't it funny they become your best buddies instantly? Oh, he's my always buddy. <laughs> he's yeah. with me all the time. Yeah. Um, our first dog, Mia, I call her my best girlfriend because that's exactly what mm -hmm. she's always been. Um, so let's get back to your dad. What did he do? My dad started as a stockbroker. Okay. And then he ultimately ended up owning two daycare centers on the south side of Chicago. Awesome. And your mom? My mom a, was a social worker. Wow. Okay. That's very interesting. So I love the fact that you said 
he he knew when history was happening. Oh yeah. He so it, he wanted to sort of absorb it in the moment. Yes. So I remember another story where a long time ago, you know, you didn't fly to Colorado to go skiing. You took the train. <laughs> okay. So my very first trip to Colorado, I went with my school. We went on the train. It dropped us off when we were done mm -hmm. um, on April 4th. Um, that was my dad's birthday. He picked me up downtown Chicago. It was the, t the day Martin Luther King was shot. Wow. And he goes, I want to show you my daycare centers on the south side of Chicago. And so I said, okay, we're driving to down this into the south side of Chicago. And he goes, mm -hmm. get down, Robin, they're shooting at us. Oh, my gosh. We were fine. And believe it or not, his daycare centers were fine. Wow. But once again, it was like, you got to see this. Yeah. Do you ever get back to Chicago to go visit? I do. My dad passed away about nine years ago, but my mom's still there, and she's amazing. Okay. It's changed a lot, I'm assuming. It has in, from a, in when, a very good way. Right. Right. Whenever I think of the suburbs of Chicago, this is awful. I've never been. I always think of Home Alone or yeah. Uncle Buck. Oh, yeah. or That was, I think, Winnetka. That was a suburb over from us. Okay. Uh, we didn't live in a house like that, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what that's my vision of, of just, just like you said, kids running around yes. on bikes and, mm -hmm. yeah, fireflies and all that good mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so now I get why you and Dr. Jerry Mendelson are such good buds, because she's also from Chicago. She is. She grew up not far from me. That's so bizarre. Are you guys close in age? Yes, we are. That's so funny. Small. Yeah. It's a small world. We sound alike too. Oh uh, yeah, and you do. And when we get together, is it's it really, worse? It's much worse. <laughs> Our well, Midwestern accents just go crazy. Well, I just every time I see her, she always calls me kiddo, and yeah. that's my favorite thing mm -hmm. ever. It's when she calls me kiddo. So what was what were you like in high school? Uh, I was pretty much of a nerd. <laughs> I went to Nutra <laughs> High School, Nutra West. Okay. Um, it was a high school where there were some amazing people that went to my high school. So even if I had been exceptional, I would have been, I mean, I would have been mediocre. Hmm. Um, and I don't know how exceptional I was. I mean, I did well. Mm -hmm. But I was with people like Ed Zwick, who was a year ahead of me. Ed Zwick was the, is the producer, director for Shakespeare in Love. He's an incredibly talented guy. Um, Christy Gunn, who was Christy Hefner, Hugh Hefner's daughter. Okay. Um, I One of my good friends is a guy named Richard Lipton, and he was one of the originators of, he made or came up with Imitrex. Wow. Quite so, the mean, list. I had all these amazing people in my class. So I was like, you know, mm -hmm. you're average. Oh, uh, I don't believe that. You are I, I'm average overachiever. That's what I would call myself. Okay. A smart, <laughs> you were a smarty pants, though. Not like them. No? No. They were amazing. Oh, Christine Ebersol, who's won a bunch of Tonys, mm -hmm. incredibly talented singer. She was in my class. That's kind of a, a good list you have there. Of, I know. Of people. It was quite a high school. What made you decide to go to medical school? Well, that's an interesting story. So when I was in college, mm -hmm. um, I was in the lowest level of English you could get. That was not my thing. <laughs> and the teacher said to me, you know, you know, Robin, I don't think you should do anything English related. <laughs> You might want to look at science. Right, right. And I went, oh, okay. And I actually was pretty good at science. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I saw these guys around me saying they're going to medical school. I'm like, I could be as good as them. Psh, I could do that. If not better. Right. So that was my challenge to myself. I, wow. I don't really know that I was thinking of medicine in such, you know, altruistic terms. Right. But I did like people. I did like science. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I can do this. And you were a little competitive, it sounds like. Oh, uh, very. Very competitive. Yes. Okay, I like that. And that's funny because I went into journalism because I don't do math. I, I do, don't do numbers. Science scares the you-know-what out of me, and English just makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. So just different. Well, I think it's interesting that I've written three books since then. That is interesting. And I'd love to find her and say, you know... You might want to think about that assessment. Because that's one of your loves, actually, is it writing. Is. I love to write. Right. So um, very different there. Yeah, if that professor could see you now. If she could, if I remembered her name, I'd call her out. <laughs> call her out on the podcast. Like, lady. <laughs> yeah, look at me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so beyond medical school, though, what made you decide to practice what you're practicing now? What, you know, what kind of said, this is what I want to do? Well, that's a really good question. So when I first started, I was in research. I mm -hmm. did a fellowship at Johns Hopkins where okay. I did preventive cardiology. Mm -hmm. This was in the mid-80s. 
early to mid 80s. Okay. And at that time, we did a lot of things in terms of preventive cardiology that made sense. So healthy lifestyle, mm -hmm. exercise, mm -hmm. healthy diet, all those things that made sense. Um, and then later on, we moved to Medford where I was doing um, urgent care, ultimately internal medicine. Okay. And I remember being at a meeting, this was in the early 90s, okay. um, giving a lecture on how you help prevent heart disease. And one of the cardiologists stood up and said, you don't have to do that anymore. We've got statin drugs now. People can like eat their Twinkies and still be fine. Mm. And if they got heart disease, we could open it up with a stent now. And I'm like, no. There's something wrong with that. There's a problem here. Right. But that was the beginning of just about a pill for everything. That was in the early 90s? That was in the early 90s. So we mm. now had pills for cholesterol. We had pills to lower your blood pressure. We had pills to make you happy. We had pills to help your erectile dysfunction. We had all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was a shift in medicine mm. where you could have the 10 minute visits because all you're doing is giving pills out anyway, right? Yeah. So uh, late 1900, 1999, okay. 2000, I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm done with this. I was in a room with a patient writing my 10th prescription thinking, you know what? She really needs me to talk to her and figure out what's wrong with her. This is nonsense. Mm. And I actually got up after that and I quit. Whoa. Mm-hmm. You just said, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. So I applied for an integrative medicine fellowship with Dr. Andrew Weil in Arizona. Okay. And that's what I did. And I actually talked to Asante at the time and said, I'd want to do this. What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. They said, that's a great idea. And they actually paid for my fellowship. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's an investment. It was. Yeah. And do you think looking back in the early 90s, the pill for everything, I mean, because we could talk about healthcare forever, but that, as you mentioned, changed a lot of how doctors and patient, that whole relationship. Absolutely. And kind totally of changed and, it. and not for the good. No, not for the good. And I still think there's a real, a real problem mm -hmm. with communication with patients. I mean, no one even, if you have somebody who's 300 pounds, they're not even saying anything about their weight. Right. Like, hello, maybe you should think about losing some weight. Yikes. They won't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you let's back up just a little bit. Uh, you said you moved to the Rogue Valley when? 1991. Okay. And why the Rogue Valley? This is from, where were you at the time? We were in New York, actually. At that point, I had moved to Stony to, to teach at Stony Brook in New York. Okay. University, State University of New York. Okay. Um, my husband was doing private practice on, in Huntington. And that is? Dr. Peter, Peter Addison. Addison, yes. And I didn't like it there. I had this horrible feeling something bad was going to happen there. Really? I did. Did something ever bad happen? Uh, yeah, 9-11 happened. Mm. So you, so, okay. And I, I just had a feeling it was going to be something like that. Really? Some horrible disaster. Um, how did you and Peter meet? In medical school. Oh, really? Yes. He went, we both went to the University of Illinois, which we both say is the bargain in the Midwest. It was really <laughs> inexpensive. <laughs> it was so inexpensive compared to all the other medical schools. Yeah. Where's he from originally? He's originally from Brooklyn, but he went to Northwestern, established citizenship in Illinois, mm -hmm. and that's how he got to go to the University of Illinois. Okay, so you guys met in medical school. What was it about him that you liked instantly? Well, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't like him at all. <laughs> He, he, he liked you instantly. No, uh -uh. no, he didn't like me either. He thought I was too studious, and I thought he was obnoxious. And he, he thought he was too cocky. Yes. No, not yes, Peter. Yes, true. <laughs> and so it wasn't until our last year we did a psych rotation together, mm -hmm. and that's where we, you get to know people on those rotations. Okay. Because it's all about, I know you talk about yourself. You talk mm -hmm. about. That's how the psych rotations go. It's really more about you than anyone else. Okay. And we really got to know each other, and I realized, you know, I really like this guy. Mm -hmm. And then you were married when? Um, we didn't get married till 1985. Oh, okay. So you were together for a long time before you got married. Together, not together, together, not together. Oh, you know it was one of those. <laughs> that, that's sometimes good, you know. It's very good. You figure yourself out. And, you do. Yeah. And so married in 85. Yes. And then you guys moved um, together to the Rogue Valley. Yes, okay. 1991. Had you had your boys then yet, or? Yes, by the time we moved here, they were two and four. Oh, yes. little guys. So they grew up in the Rogue Valley. They did. That's awesome. They did. That's actually, yeah, really, really cool. So um, you then went, you did your fellowship, and you come back to the Rogue Valley. Um, 
a lot of things had changed at that point for you as far as your occupation goes and your profession. You you were taking a different approach to oh, medicine. Oh, totally. So when I was uh, back east, mm -hmm. I had gotten something called the Preventive Cardiology Academic Award from the NHLBI. It was a huge honor. Only, I think, my year, four, maybe five people got it. Mm -hmm. Out of all the people that wow. applied, it was looking at preventive cardiology, how to prevent heart attacks in families at high risk. At that time, I got $550,000 to do the, the grant. Dang, Gina. Um, but I couldn't take it with me, mm -hmm. so I had to give it to someone oh, at Stony Brook. Okay. Um, that was huge. That was a huge sacrifice in some ways. In other ways, I just was happy to be out of New York. And I did a huge shift from research to pri practice again. And, mm -hmm. you know, I realized what I really liked was taking care of patients. Awesome. And I had missed that. So I was really happy to be doing that. And it was a huge change for me. But I also noticed a huge change in Medford because I had actually, when I was, I, sh I moved my from my internship in Washington, D.C., where I did my initial year, mm -hmm. to OHSU. That's where I did my residency. Oh, okay. And they actually sent me to Medford. <laughs> for like five or six weeks to d learn primary care at the Medford Clinic. This was in 1980. What, what did you think of, of this place when I you were here? I really liked it, but I didn't see a future for me as a single woman at the time. Okay. I'm like, no way. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, I'm picking up what you're laying down. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it, and they loved me because there weren't that many women physicians at the time. Oh, sure. So they offered me a job then, right on the spot, oh, when that's... I got done. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. No, no. But when we decided to move, we came back here and I said, is that job offer still there? And they said, yeah, and we need a gastroenterologist too. So that's sort of what happened. So I was working with all these people that had actually known in 1980, 11 how, years before. Isn't it funny how, and I've talked with a few people specifically on this podcast, what links you back here? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people have lived here or they would come through and visit and think how pretty it was and then now they've been here for 30 years or something. Right. So I just find it interesting, the parallel pathways. So I don't know. I mean, I look at Dr. Mendelssohn. You know, she grew up in Chicago, and now she's here in the Rogue Valley. I know. Very cool. Well, we both know why that is. I mean, who wants to be in another Chicago winter? Horrible. <laughs> no. <laughs> and she was. I think she was there when I was there, and it was 1979. That winter was horrible. It was a freaking disaster. Oh. Sounds like it. Um, going back to <laughs> Stony Brook, which, by the way, for all the Babysitter Club readers out there, the the whole book is based in Stony Brook. It is? But I think it was Connecticut. Stony Brook, Connecticut. Oh, okay. But anytime I hear Stony Brook, I think of the Babysitter's Club. Oh, that's interesting. That's, that's well, my Stony nerd. Well, Stony pretty ideal, the little community. Well, this in this book, this community was very ideal. Mm -hmm. These girls grew up in Stony Brook, babysitting and getting into all sorts of shenanigans. But anyways... What, um, you didn't like it there. No. Even though, and we're kind of jumping around, but you, even though this sounds like an ideal community and quaint, you still didn't like it there because there was something that you felt just was not right about. Yes, this I, I didn't fit. No? It wasn't a fit. I, I wanted to be, to be surrounded by lots of beauty and an area where I felt safe, where mm -hmm. my kids could run around. And you didn't feel safe? No, I didn't feel safe there. Hmm. Interesting. For what, a lot of different reasons. What year was this? This was 1986 was when I moved there, mm -hmm. and then we left in 91. Okay. And it sounds like you've never looked back. It was the best decision no. ever. No. I miss some of the people, but sure. No. That's always good, too, when you a move like that, because you went from Stony Brook to the Rogue Valley. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think you could get, you know, go farther in, in the United States, but uh, across no. the country, and no. that was a big deal. But looking back, you're thinking it was a brilliant move. Oh, yes. And Peter, my husband, would say the same thing. Awesome. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, I know you're a big music fan. Because yes. you're, every time I go to a Brit concert, I see you there. Yes. So um, you and you and Peter love going to the Brit. Yes. Okay. What is it about the Brit that you love? Well, I love the music. I love the venue. It's just fun. It's what a fun evening mm -hmm. to have. You know, you can drink your wine. Mm -hmm. Well, their wine now. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> bring your food. And just enjoy it. It's really, really a great way. Uh, what do you think about this season? Oh, uh, it's it's okay. Do you have? Are there seasons where you're like, this season's going to be amazing, and then others like, it looks good. Yeah, that's that's one of these. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I've always been surprised 
when I think, eh, it's, it's okay, and then I'm like, wow, that was great. Mm -hmm, for sure. What concert are you looking forward to? Um, Jason Mraz. I love Jason Mraz and Brett Dunn, and I love them both. So I'm okay. really looking forward to that one. Um, I know you've seen Brandi Carlisle before. Yes. Right? Okay, so that's my heart throb. And we're gonna go see her too. Oh, I'm so excited. That's that's the one show I'm looking forward to seeing. But she's been here so many times. She has. And I think that's really cool. A lot of these artists come back to the Rogue Valley. I think they want to, don't you? I do. I really do. I think they put it on their list of a stopover place because they love it. It's special. It is special. There's nothing like the top of the Brit where the picnic tables are, mm -hmm. and you can see Roxy Ann, and you can see that little sort of slice of the valley. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's it's heaven. It is. And then when it gets dark and you see all the lights, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Um, so going from music to dancing, I know you're a big dancer. Yes. Big dancer. When did that start for you? Uh, well, I did Dancing with the Rogue Valley Stars. I was in the first group <laughs> with Gemini. Nice. You know, I go back and forth on this all the time. In 2009, <laughs> he won. I came in third. Ugh. I know. Was there ever a rematch? No, I keep trying to challenge him, but he, he's not interested. <laughs> it's kind of like when you win at Monopoly. You never play Monopoly ever again. Exactly. So he got first. He's done. He's done. No. He was good, though. He really was good. Um, we're going to call him out, DJ Jim, and I think there needs to be a rematch. I would love a rematch. Awesome. Um, and so I started that, and I thought, you know, that was so much fun. I did the tango. Mm -hmm. It was Argentine tango, which was wonderful. I okay. love my little dance partner, who at the time was 21, I think. And, and Brett you were, Allman. You were older than him, oh, obviously. Oh, obviously. <laughs> um, I think I was... Older than his mother, I'm oh. not sure. Oh, boy. But it was really fun. We had yeah. so much fun, and it was so. I felt so good after that mm. um, that I wanted to keep going. So I kept doing tango for a while, and then I decided to get into West Coast Swing. Okay. And it's just been amazing. It sounds a little like an addiction for it you. It is. It's an addiction for sure, but a healthy one. Exactly. Um, how often do you dance? I dance two to three times a week at least. Okay. Um, and I think dancing, I was a dancer for a long time. It takes, um, you have to be limber, so you have to be stretched out all mm -hmm. the time. You're, it's an aerobic exercise, so all of those different things come into play when you're dancing. And you don't even realize you're exercising. That's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. and, and you can really get sweaty and get your heart rate up doing dancing. And it's good for your brain, which is what I wrote about in, in our book, Healed Health and Wellness for the 21st Century, which you can get at Amazon.com. Plug. I like it. <laughs> this is your third book, though. It is. Okay, so tell me about the other two. So I wrote this. I used to go to um, Hoover School where the kids would ask me questions, mm -hmm. medical questions. And that what they would do is they'd write their questions and put them in a box. Okay. And then I'd pick out the ones I wanted to answer. And so I had so many. I thought, I should just start writing the answers of these things because I wanted to answer everyone. Mm -hmm. And I went, wait a minute. I have a book here. So I wrote, kids ask the doctor. I left all their questions the same as the way they wrote them. Cute. Like, why do we urinate? Y-E-R-N-A-T-E. -E. <laughs> so it's really, really cute. And I would put their first names and their ages. And what's really funny is some of them now have kids that age. So cute. So <laughs> kids ask the doctor. Then I wrote The Smart Woman's Guide to Midlife and Beyond with one of my colleagues from internship, mm -hmm. Dr. Janet Horn. That's still relevant today. Awesome. And that's available on Amazon. They've taken it out of print, but you can still get pr the print version, mm -hmm. but you can also download it on Kindle. Okay. Uh, why do we urinate? <laughs> you have to get rid of all those toxins in your system. Exactly. I, I knew that answer, but I just had to ask. <laughs> um, and what is it about writing, you think, that just really gets you going? Um, I, I enjoy it. It's cathartic in some ways. And then what happened when I started doing this integrative medicine fellowship is I started to discovering new things that people, I felt patients really need to know about. Um, and other physicians were not doing them. Mm -hmm. So how do you get, mm -hmm. how do you start the change? Well, you do it with patients as the drivers. And that is what motivates me now. I believe there's some certain things that people should be doing and they're not, and they're safer, and they're of more benefit, but what, for whatever reason, Doctors don't adopt them. And it, part of the problem is we're so ingrained in what we do. Mm -hmm. It takes about 10 years for physicians to adopt new things when you look at it. Wow. 10 years. Well, I don't think these patients have 10 years. A lot of them don't. So it's time to know what to do now. And one of the things I've done in this book, Healed, um, Health and Wellness for the 21st Century, <laughs> that I wrote with Dave Kahn, 
who's my dance partner. Yes. Um, I have a cheat sheet in the back of that book where people can actually pull it out and bring it to their doctors and say, look, this, these are the tests I want. Mm -hmm. Call Robin if you have any questions. I like it. Do you look at certain people and after talking to them to, for a while and kind of getting a sense of their, I guess, regimen for health, does it just frustrate you so much when people aren't taking care of themselves, aren't doing really small things to be better? It used to, but the way I do my practice now, mm -hmm. um, I do not take insurance. People actually pay up front to see me. So you're not going to pay up front if you're not going to listen to what I have to say or if you're not willing to change. So I actually have people that want to change. Mm -hmm. So I've, so I've kind of self, people self-select for my practice, which is right. fantastic. That's smart. So I'd say 70 to 80% of my patients get better versus before when maybe 20% would do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimate was when I was at a clinic one volunteering at, at a clinic. I mm -hmm. will not mention which clinic That's it was. That's all right. That's all right. And um, I remember telling this woman who was newly diagnosed with diabetes, you're going to have to stop eating donuts for breakfast every day. And she said, I can't. I can't give up my donuts. I'm like, okay. Well, that's fine. Go ahead, eat your donuts, but I can't. Well, I won't be able to help you with your blood sugars if you're not willing to change your diet. Mm -hmm. And so... Donuts are delicious, but not are. every day. Not every day. Right. And processed foods in general are just not good for you. Yeah. What, what do you see is the, the number one thing that um, unhealthy people are doing? Is it food? It's food. Diet. Absolutely. And, you know, part of it's they're addicted to these things. Mm -hmm. They're addicting. McDonald's is addicting. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this great book. I can't remember the order, but it's like fat, sugar, salt. I probably got the mm -hmm. the order wrong, but it's about how the food companies have figured out the perfect way to get you hooked on their food. Mm -hmm. So any guesses as to what is the perfect food company food that they have figured out? Right. Uh, it's not Fast Food Nation, is it? No. Fast Food Nation is fascinating. Yes. It's a fascinating, and that's the McDonald's, the right. addiction to McDonald's. But yeah. what food would you guess? Oh, what I guess that's per the, the perfect processed food that gets people hooked. French fries. Close. Cheetos. Cheetos. Cheetos are the perfect food. Perfectly salty, enough sugar, um, and they're crunchy. Totally addicting. Interesting. It's Cheetos. I'm not a big fan of Cheetos. I love Cheetos. I don't touch them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you shouldn't touch them because, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I get to work anyway. <laughs> it would match my uh, shirt. Yeah. You, but. You, you touch them and there's Cheeto dust everywhere. <laughs> That's so funny. But yeah, it's, it is it is diet. And a lot of people say, well, I just need to hit the gym. And I personally think it starts with what we're putting in our bodies. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. They've shown you can't exercise your weight away alone. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, you could, I mean, if you burn more than you eat, mm -hmm. but odds are you're not going to. So it's what you eat. And I think it's also intimidating for people who, um, my husband used to be a personal trainer and he says this all the time, people who are used to drinking like a you know, a six pack of Coke every day, you know, maybe let's drop it down to like two a day and then mm -hmm. one and then hopefully none. But it's it's just things like that. Like you can't expect people to change instantly overnight. No. It takes time, but I think it's that willingness, like you said, to actually make a change in your own body. Yes, and small changes. Small changes. And one of the things I've realized in my practice is it's all about those little changes. Mm -hmm. A bunch of little changes mm -hmm. that we can make that make a huge difference. Okay. Um, you and Mr. Peter love to travel. Yes. Where'd you guys go last? Israel. Wow. What was that like? Great. Yeah. It was great. I'm so glad we went when, when we went. <laughs> oh, for sure. Uh, next trip on the agenda? Do you have one? Uh, we're either, we're talking about Machu Picchu. Okay. And the other one is the Galapagos. What is it about traveling you two enjoy so much? It's just so much fun. You meet wonderful people. You see different things. You get away from work and mm -hmm. all the stresses. It's amazing. Is he a good traveling buddy? He's a great traveling buddy. Yeah. He's so easy. Yeah. He seems that way. He's very easy. And you guys are big. Well, I say you guys, but it's really Peter are just big, big wine people. Yeah, it's him, not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're actually growing grapes. Yes. And we're, our first bottling will be in a couple months. Fantastic. It'll be called Peter William Vineyard. It's going to be good, too. Really yeah. good. Uh, what kind of wine? Is it a blend or? Malbec, Tempranillo, Grenache, and Syrah. Okay. The Grenache will be a blend. 
Um, he is so knowledgeable about wine. Where he did is. that come from? You know, he's just a savant when it comes to wine. He um, got turned on to wine by his uncle when mm -hmm. he was like just out of high school. Mm -hmm. And just, I don't know what happened. Some people get that way. He's yeah. turned a few buddies that way too. That's awesome. No, he's, he's very knowledgeable. If I ever, ever have a question, usually if I'm drinking something and I see him at an event, he goes, oh, that's good. And then he'll tell me everything else that I didn't really yes. want to know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I like that. I like that. Um, okay, so final three, my final three questions. Best advice you've ever been given? It was by Peter's dad. Hmm. And, and it was? I, it, it, when I first went, started my internship, this is what he said. Write it down, be on time, and, oh, shoot. <laughs> What's the third thing? Write it down. Be on time and do it now. Good advice. There I like we go. I like the be on time. Yes. And when you're an intern, it's really important to do it now or you're gonna forget. Like I just forgot, do it now. Right, right. <laughs> that was in Vegas agrees with us. <laughs> um, if you ever moved away from the Rogue Valley, what would bring you back here? What would you miss the most? Hmm. Oh, just the beauty, my friends. And if my family were here, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of family, you have two boys. I do. And they're two <laughs> yeah. ad adult boys now. Yes, they are. Living fabulous lives. Yes, they're both in L.A. They're doing really well. Awesome. And yeah. they visit a lot. No. No. We, we go to visit them. <laughs> and now, now there's like plenty of plane rides we can go nonstop, Perfect. which is great. Perfect. Okay. And last question. If you were given a final meal and a final drink, what would that be? Mm. French fries. Really? And I know this is terrible because, you know, my husband's a wine guy, mm -hmm. but it would be a vodka and tonic. Okay. That's not <laughs> terrible. That's not terrible at all. Um, excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. If you're listening to this podcast on iTunes and you like it, please subscribe, rate, and review. That helps other people find us. Check out the video portion of this podcast at ktbl.com. Just click on features, then off script. Very interesting. I want to have you back so we can talk more about health and medicine. Oh, definitely. Okay. Thanks. Dr. Robin Miller.